Um, I, I have always enjoyed, in the years I've been preaching, in uh, some of the holidays like Mother's Day and Father's Day because of the easiness of knowing what your topic's going to be. And with Mother's Day, it's always one of those things where everybody talks about how sweet you are and how good the lesson that was and things. And then Father's Day, are like, wow, you really threw us under the bus again. <laughs> but today, I, I don't want it to be that way. Uh, Father's Day is, is uh, different, obviously, for me this year. This is my first year without my father. And I know many of you are in that same boat that you don't have your father. I know several do not have a father who was a Christian. But for this audience here, for probably the greatest majority, if not all, the fathers in this audience have obeyed the gospel and are children of God and are striving to raise their family the way that God intended. And so this morning, what I want to do is to especially emphasize to our young people the job that your father has and the great importance his role has in your life. If you open your Bibles back to Proverbs chapter 4, we're going to look at that in just a moment. But in that, those verses that were read, the wise man talks about the advice that he's giving his son and the importance that this advice is going to have throughout that son's life and what his intention is in giving that guidance to his son. And so we're going to see that a father's perspective is so very vital, and we're going to discuss why this morning. So if you're ready for your three words, let's see the notebooks. Very, very good. Okay, here's your three words. Understanding, discipline, and leadership. When you think about the father's role, what a father is supposed to do, the thing that makes a father like the father, it has to do with things like this. Knowing that our God does understand us, and we as fathers are to be understanding our families as well. That our father above practices discipline, and it's for our good that he does that and not because and simply because he might be angry about something that has taken place. And leadership, God tells us what he expects from us with no fear or favoritism. And that's how fathers are to be. I appreciate the, the prayer that was led this morning that talked about doing what is right regardless of the consequences. That is what a father does. And it's a hard and difficult role because there's people that don't appreciate it. In our culture, we are attacked. Fathers are attacked constantly. And it's not just the sitcoms anymore. It's not just the television shows and movies anymore. From the highest office in our land all the way down to the school system, you have nothing but attacks on what manhood really is. Because now when you talk about manhood, there's this word that's put in front of it about masculinity called toxic masculinity. And so someone who practices Discipline, someone who practices leadership, someone who stands behind something regardless of the consequences is not loved or appreciated by the society which we live in. So you be thankful for your father for standing firm and standing at the door of his house and saying it may happen all, all around us and in this world that we live in, but not in this home. It will not happen. That is a good godly father that needs to be appreciated. And the reason being, when you go back to Proverbs chapter 4, you see that he says in verse 20, in verses uh, 20 through 27, he's in verse 20 giving his son advice, and he says to give attention to his words and his sayings. If you know your father, you know he has a lot of sayings. <laughs> and this father had sayings as well. But notice that these are the, he doesn't go into what those are right here specifically. But notice what he wants his son to pay attention with. In verse 20, Incline your ear. In verse 21, your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Verse 22 says that you have to search for these things to find them, and they'll be health to your flesh, your whole body. In verse 24, after he talks about the heart again, in verse 23, put away deceitfulness from your mouth. Again, he goes back to the eyes in verses 25, uh, and talking about the eyes and the eyelids. In verse 26, the path of the feet is talked about. And in verse 27, do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. He goes about being very, very specific about what he wants his child to do. You pay attention to what I'm telling you. And let it control the things that you hear. Let it control the things that you see. Let it control the paths that you go on. Let it control the things that you actually allow into your heart. Because if you do not, out of the heart, this is where all these evil things can spring from. 
the diligence of protecting the heart is the source of life. And fathers know that. And they know that if they're going to capture their children's hearts, they have to have the right perspective about what's going to happen. And in the future, what are they going to encounter? What are they going to hear? What are they going to see? What are going to be the paths that are available to them? What are the things and who are the people who will try to capture their heart? They need to contemplate the path that they're on because it's not just about the sin that's being committed, but it's about the sin that can be committed. And that's what the father's on guard against. It's not just about when the, the child falls into sin that the father says, here's your way out of it. Your father tells you, don't go that way because this is where it ends up. Our God, our Father in heaven, knows the end of the, thing, of the thing from the beginning. And I believe that the scriptures give this to the role of the Father as well as being a visionary. In Proverbs 19 and verse 20, there's a very interesting word that's used. And the Hebrew is akarit. And this word is used about 60 times, 60 plus times in the Old Testament. And it's used 13 times in the book of Proverbs alone. It is that word latter days that you see in this verse. And I chose a very simple proverb that says that listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. It's a very easy proverb to understand. It's one that is, is not something that's controversial. That if you listen to good advice, if you heed good counsel and get instruction, then as you get older, you're going to grow more and more wise in your latter days. This word is also translated many times, end. And when you think about proverbs, there's so many times where he talks about the end of of a thing, how this is going to end up, where this is going to lead, the path and its direction that it's going in. In, in a lot of ways, it's like if I were to show you a $1 bill and I were to show you the backside of that $1 bill, you know if I turn that $1 bill around, who's going to be on it? You know that already. That's what this word is really talking about. You know the end of a thing, the back of a thing, what's going to happen from the things that you're presently seeing. That's the role that fathers have. And that's what this father is doing with his children as well. In Proverbs 12 and verse 8, it says this, A man will be commended according to his wisdom, but he who is of a perverse heart will be despised. What is the end? He knows that his son, this wise man, this king, knows that his son is going to be judged by the the decisions that he makes, and how much wisdom he exercises. We also know that a man who has a perverse heart, that person's going to be despised. And so what path should I be putting my child on? What decisions do I need to make while my child is young so that when he grows old, he will be commended because of his wisdom and not commended because he was perverse? not commended because he was rich, not commended because he was powerful, not commended because he was successful in the ways of the world, but that this individual that I raised, this person I raised, was wise. Which do we want? That's why your father does a lot of the things that he does. That's why he does try to control what you hear, what you see, what you think, places you go, people you associate with. That's why he pays so much attention to that. And that's why those rules are in place. Be thankful that you have a father who's trying to raise a wise child in the ways of the world. Uh, there's a couple of places in Proverbs that are real easy to see this. Go to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, we'll look at a few verses there. Proverbs chapter 7, and starting at verse 1. <clears throat> Again, he says to his son, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands. Notice these words. Keep, treasure, keep. Again, your eye. Verse 3, he's going to talk about binding and writing like it's a tablet. Verse 4, he's going to talk about a sister or nearest kin. And verse 5, he's going to talk about people who flatter with the words. Notice the association. You keep my words. Treasure my commands within you. Keep commands and live. That's the purpose. Keep commands and live. My law, the law of your father, the law that your father has given to you, the rules that he has laid down, you keep those as the apple of your eye. You bind them on your fingers, just like you would something that you're using to remind yourself of something so you don't forget. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Writing on a tablet demanded a, a hammer and a chisel, really, when you think about it in those terms. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, because judgment about a young man and what's best for a young man 
it's good to know that he has someone who is of a female persuasion who can relate as well. They can judge this woman that he's going to talk about next a lot better. And call understanding your nearest kin, this is why, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. So he sets the stage. This is why I want you to follow what I tell you. Imagine if you will, this young, you're looking out your window and this young man is walking down the street and there's one particular row where this seductress, this harlot, if you will, is where she lives. And she's constantly beckoning people into her home. And many of people have went there and followed that path. That's what this father is saying when he says, For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding. I think some of your versions, which I like a lot better, say this. A young man who lacks sense. Your father does have sense. Your father has seen these paths. It may be that your father one day walked those paths. And when he sees others walking that path, he knows where it leads. And he knows what's down that road. And he knows what's going to happen. So he doesn't tell the young man, once he's at that house, get out of that house. Don't go down that road. And you'll never end up there. You don't start a sinful habit, you'll never be addicted to a sinful habit. You don't begin something that one day you're going to have to end, is what the father's telling his son. Later in this same chapter, Proverbs chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, notice this. Proverbs 7, 21 through 23. With her enticing speech, she, carried, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her like a dumb animal. Like an ox goes to the slaughter. A fool to the correction of the stocks. Or a stag, somebody, I think the ESV says, a stag that's caught fast. Till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. You know who did know it would cost him his life? His father. His father knew it. The young man didn't. The young man thought he could go down the path. The young man thought that he would not yield, but she seduced him. She persuaded. And it cost him his life. And he didn't know it. Proverbs chapter 5 is very similar. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, again, is talking about the perils actually of adultery at this particular uh, junction when it says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable, you don't know them. So again, your father's trying to control the way that you think. Don't think about her path. Don't wonder about it. Don't imagine it. Don't fantasize about it. Verse 7, Therefore hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Remove the opportunity, is what he tells them. It, it's, it's so interesting that when you, you think about the way that we look at sin, is that, and, and we've been talking about this a lot in our grace studies, that it, it's such a common thing that it's only the sin itself that we consider. And the grace of God teaches us to stay away from things that are not sober, righteous, and godly. It teaches us things about righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. It teaches us what God wants from us and how to achieve it. You know, when Paul was preaching to the, or teaching, or talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 27, he says in verse 20 that I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught it publicly and from house to house. And in verse 27, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, not just bits and pieces of it, but everything. And we also need to be teaching one another what it is that is helpful. And it is helpful to understand the end of a thing before you get involved in it. 
to contemplate the path. A father is not one that can get caught up in the moment. He has to be one who is persuaded by the things in which he has seen, the paths that others have went down, and realize that this is not a way that something happens. This is the way it happens. And it's that way every time. It is the lust of the flesh, it is the lust of the eye, and it is the pride of life every time. And fathers, we know that, don't we? We know it because we've been victims to it. We know it because we've seen others do it when we looked out our window and saw a person who had no sense and went down that way. We've known it when we've talked to people and told them, don't go down that path, don't do that thing. This is where it's going to lead. And they're just like a, a dumb animal. And they cannot be persuaded. Your father's trying to control what you think, what you hear, and what you see, and where you go, and who you go with. And the reason being is because he does not want you to be a dumb animal like the rest of the world that you're living in the midst of. Is that plain? Is that clear? That is a task that your father has that is difficult. So buy him a steak today. <laughs> Give him a tie. But more than anything else, hug him a little tighter and tell him thank you. Thank you for setting some boundaries. Thank you for being stern. Thank you for not yielding. Thank you for guarding this family. Thank you for towing the line when everyone else is giving in. Thank you for doing it God's way. It's a hard and difficult role. In Proverbs 23, there's another example. And really, there's several here in Proverbs chapter 23. But here at the end, especially in Proverbs 23 and starting at verse 22 and going through the end of the chapter, <clears throat> he says again, Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she's old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. So again, he's talking about that akarit, the end of a thing. Let us be happy about who you are. Give me your heart, in verse 26. Let your eyes observe my ways. He's not just saying and not doing. A harlot is a deep pit. And a seductress is a narrow well. She lies in wait for a victim. Again, seductress. And there's a lot of things that can be termed a seductress in this world. One of them he talks about in verses 29 through the end of the chapter when he talks about alcohol. And one of the things that he says about alcohol is this. Do not look at it as a swirling in the cup. And don't stare at it. Don't linger at that. Don't keep contemplating that because what's going to happen? You obviously don't hate it and you're not afraid of it because you're lingering at it. And you're wondering and contemplating, can it really be that bad? It doesn't look that bad. And like Eve, it's good for food, it's pleasing to the eye, it's desires to make one wise. And he shows the folly of that. And even outside of alcohol and drugs, sex, computers, companions, all of these things are the same way. Again, we need to be just as terrified. And your father hates the way just as he does, just as much as he does, the sin that it leads to. That's what godly fathers do. And that's why we stand the ground that we stand upon. In Proverbs 16 and verse 32, I think one of the things, and I want us to have a reminder of this, especially in the day and age in which we're living in. If there's one thing that I think our children are going to be dealing with a lot right now is anger. There's a lot of anger and there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of things going on in the world. And unfortunately, parents, we've allowed anger to dictate our actions. And that is plain simple. Plain and simply, wrong, evil, 
It is sinful. The way in which the world has reacted to different situations is anger first and then learn second. Instead of learn first and then try to do something constructive. And that is not God's way of doing things. When we just strike out before we even know what we're striking against. The Bible warns about it. Fathers, be on guard against this with your children. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules the spirit than he who takes the city. That's the kind of person that we're trying to raise. The one that can control their anger. In Proverbs 17 and verse 14, the beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before the quarrel starts. Be careful about the way you teach your children and the perspective that they have of other people. Right now, there are so many forces that are going on that are trying to divide people by everything. Economic status, racial status, whatever it may be, marital status, whether or not you think there's only two genders, everything in the world is being divisive and telling us we are supposed to hate someone. We are supposed to be angry with someone. Someone has to be the blame for what's going on. That verse right there tells you the beginning of strife is like releasing water. How much water has to be released in the ceiling of your home before the roof comes crashing in? Stop those things before they start. When you see that in your child early, stop it then. And do not let it fester because we have to stand guard. Proverbs 18 and verse 13 says that he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Fathers, we don't give in to the passions of the situations. We are not dictated by the circumstance of what's going on. Fathers, we are patient. Fathers, we look at the end of a thing before we act. Fathers are visionaries. And so what should we be teaching them? 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's turn there together. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. 1 Peter 3 and starting at verse 10. Again, think of that akarit, that, that end of a thing from the beginning. Verse 10. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better. If it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Fathers, how many of us have or need to sit down at the foot of the bed with one of our children and just recite that. How much better off would things be if there were more fathers who could just sit down with their children and just recited that? If that was the plaque that was in your household, that was the motto that we talked about a few months ago that you had, that mission statement for your home, was that. I want my children to have a good life and to, and to have good days ahead of them. And that means they may suffer. But I know this, if they're suffering and it's because they lived a godly life, I'm okay with that. I am perfectly fine with that. I bless my God and thank my God for that. That when they've been put to the test after they're outside of my home, especially, that they stand in the midst of the struggle and the strife and the persecution and the hardships and the difficulties, especially those who come along with the, the uh, evil, corrupt thinking, and they're able to stand strong, I'm okay with that. Because I know that I put them on the right path. That their ears, their eyes, their heart, their feet, all of these things were directed by those little sayings that I gave to them along the way. And those things that I taught them as, 
of what God expects. And so as, as we bring it to a conclusion, these are some things to think about. A father's perspective is, is that he is determined to do these things. One thing that he's determined to do is to understand. And it's not always easy for us fathers to understand. You know, my son, I understand a lot of things about him because I, I was a guy too. I understand why he does some of the things that he did. It still blows my mind, surprises me, but I understand it. When my daughter's crying and there's no reason to cry, I don't understand that. <laughs> but I'm determined to do so. And one of the things that we're supposed to be able to do, as it says in Proverbs 20 and verse 5, if we are people of understanding, counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. One of the things that we need to be able to do with our children is to draw out what's going on, to draw out what it is that they're thinking, to ask the why. I believe that you ought to have at least four or five layers deep of why statements whenever you're encountering an issue or a problem with another individual, especially someone in your family that you're close to. Why did you do this? Why did that make you do that? Why was that so important that it led to that? And to be able to just keep digging and digging and deep digging and digging until you reach the source. Where is that deep water? Where can I draw it out from? Because if I want to save my child, I cannot just say to them, no, don't do that, and then go on my way. I have to have some understanding. We, we know as fathers and husbands, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 very well, where it says, Husbands likewise dwell with them, speaking of their wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. We know that's also that same way of digging deep within our relationship with our spouse to know what it is that's going on and what they're thinking. And one of the things we as men need to be able to do is that when it comes to the wife, she is the one who sets that tone for the house. We, we know that from our studies about women. She's the one that gives the joy, the, the peace, the, the, uh, uh, the structure, the, the schedule for the home. She does all of those things so well. In Proverbs, it says this in chapter 11, verse 29, he who troubles his own house will inherit the wind and the fool will be servant to the wise. Men, when we come into the house, we need to understand that our wives have been working very hard to create a good, positive, uplifting atmosphere that's conducive to growth spiritually. And when we come in from work and we're pessimistic, we come in from work and we're irritable and grumpy, we come in from work and we're not loving and don't want to spend time. We don't even want to see the faces of our children. We are troubling our own house by doing so. And like it says here, the only thing you're going to inherit is the wind. That means nothing. There's no future to it. The akarit is not favorable. And we know that. A father is determined and he's determined to discipline. I cannot do a Father's Day lesson without using my favorite verse when it comes to this. Do not withhold correction for a from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> but this is why that's my favorite one. You think about how blatantly horrible and against modern convention it is to think about beating a child with a rod. Can it get much worse than that? It's compared to the idea that if you did that, he won't die. But guess what will happen? You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. In other words, if you don't do it, guess what you are guaranteeing? If you don't do it, guess what you're guaranteeing? Death. You want to destroy your child? Don't correct them. Don't discipline them. Don't be harsh when harshness is demanded. We all know the caveats. You start with instruction, right? Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but don't ignore the fact that the Bible says, if you beat him with a rod, he's not going to die. You don't do it, he will. And he's going to die eternally. I'd rather my child be upset with me because I took out a belt and applied corporal punishment as they call it or if you have those spoons you apply the long arm of the law <laughs> I'd rather than be upset and cry a little bit now than burn for all eternity is a father going to try to control yeah 
what you hear, what you see, what you think, where you go, and who you go with. And he's going to demand of you that you pay attention to where you're going, even if it's because you know the pain of violating it. In places like Proverbs 19 and verse 18, <clears throat> it points out <clears throat> that the time is going to come where there's not going to be hope anymore. Proverbs 19 and verse 18 says, chasing your son while there's hope. Don't set your heart on his destruction. That's not what it's about. You've got him for about 18 summers. You've got him for about 18 summers. And I dare say not all 18 are going to be times of hope. They get to be around 12, 13, 14 years old. You may have lost them. And unfortunately, you may have lost them for all time. Chasing them while there is hope. Because a father is determined to lead. And this is what we're going to be closing with. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4. Jesus chastised the Pharisees. But this is what he said. He said to the people, whatever they tell you to do, that observe and do. Because they said in Moses' seat, they have that position of authority. So whatever they tell you to do, do it. But don't do according to their works because they say and they do not do. And then he says this, they bind heavy burdens on you, but they won't even lift them with their finger. They won't help you lift them with a finger. Too many parents are parenting this way. How many parents have you heard, and I know I've heard many of them as well, I don't know what happened. I taught them right from wrong. But you know that parent never lived it. I told them not to do those things. You mean the same things that you're doing? I told them to avoid those things. You mean the things that you're participating in? That's the way that the Pharisees were leading. Instead, we're supposed to lead, and this is how fathers lead. Fathers lead like Jesus did. John 13, you remember that Jesus is there with his disciples? It's the night he's going to be betrayed. They're all arguing, fussing, and fighting about who's the greatest, just like our own families sometimes. And Jesus takes out a towel and he begins to serve, washing their feet. And he says, you call me master, you call me Lord. And you say right, because that's what I am. But Jesus says, I want you to understand what I just did here. If I be in your master and your Lord, I'm going to get down on my hands and knees with a towel and water and wash your feet, what do I want you? What do I expect from you? The best way for you to teach your children to be a servant to others, to be a servant to God, to be someone who loves and is dedicated to his family. Fathers, we get down on our hands and knees, and how much are we willing to sacrifice to teach that, that lesson to our children? There's an interesting verse in Proverbs 27, and verse, verse 8. It says, Like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. Like a bird that wanders from its nest, a man who wanders from his place. There's a lot of different applications that can be made. One is that, you know, the, the sexual part of it, that he goes out looking for that type of fulfillment elsewhere other than with his spouse. And Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Psalms, they say a lot about that and, and how wrong that is. But another thing, another application is this, that he's abandoned his responsibilities. He's abandoned his responsibility to provide. He's abandoned his responsibility to protect because he's left his place. And fathers, this is what's sad about it, and this is what we're seeing in our world. Sometimes this is happening with the father still living in the home. He's given up his place. He's given it to someone else. 70% of many kids in schools have no father at home. And I dare say the other 30% that do have a father at home, they're probably not all actually there when it comes to their place. So as I said at the beginning, hug your dad a little tighter this morning. He knows his place. He stays there at the nest where he's supposed to be. He's got the towel and the water, and he's serving his family. Even when everyone else tells them it's wrong, everyone, even when everyone else tells them it's not the way it should be, he does it because he's determined and he has a vision of the end of a thing. 
before it ever begins. Be thankful for him. Let him know that you understand exactly how difficult that job must be for him. And pray to God for him every day that you have him. Because the day will come where you do not. Be thankful. The question we'll leave with, is, with you is this. Fathers, what is your perspective? Do you have a vision of the future? Do you think about the end of a thing at the beginning of it? Do you contemplate the path that your children are going on and you set barriers and roadblocks and warning signs along the way? Are you trying your best to control the ears and the eyes and the heart and the, the, the path and the friends of your children? If so, God bless you. If you need help, here's how God will bless you. He gives instruction and he's given us to help. And that's what we're here for. If you're subject to the invitation, if we can help in any way whatsoever, please come as we stand and sing the song.